never known that uh, this part of the country was also an adjunct of Texas. I assume Mr. Swisher is taking credit for the weather as well, so there will be a line forming over here if anybody has any comments about the weather. Mr. Swisher is handing all those comments. No, brethren, if you know how many hours, scores of hours, to go into putting on this music, but uh, I hope you remember the crowd in your prayers because it's a tremendous amount of effort into putting on and praising before God and putting on their parts in the services. You now, John Wayne would have called them pilgrims. Maybe you've heard that in some of his movies. I occasionally go to one. They were the settlers, sometimes known as the immigrants. They were strangers and colonists and pioneers. They were the ones who settled a new territory first. Well, hence they were the originators. Those that blazed the new trail. Those that developed and prepared a new way. And centuries bygone, in fact, right in this very region, many trails went through here. This proximate area, the Oregon Trail. Many ones going out to California to the Gold Rush, maybe the Santa Fe Trail. I don't know how near it is to this particular area. But they settled the new frontier. They settled a new world. Brethren, just like we will do. Now, maybe you're thinking in your mind that this world's already been settled. There's hardly a nook or cranny of this giant planet of ours that man hasn't explored. Do you realize how new the world is soon going to be? I mean, by the time that the Great Tribulation has taken its toll and the wars of raging wars have taken over, and the devastation of the tremendous weaponry that we have now. At the time the day of the Lord comes and the many plagues that come, the trumpet plagues, and the vials of the book of Revelation are poured out upon this earth, what's that going to do to the very topography of this globe? And then God says that he will raise the valley and bring some of those mighty mountains down. And I will straighten the crooked places and even diminish the sea. The population of the earth will be greatly reduced, again because of the wars and the plagues and the great suffering of mankind before Jesus Christ returns. You know, it might be a lot like it was in the days of Noah. Imagine what it would be like for a moment when Noah first stepped off the ark. There he was in a brand new world. Not too awful but far into the future, we are going to be debarking in the place of safety into a new world. Our children, as Mr. Gore was bringing out in the sermon app, are going to be the physical leaders, or at least have the opportunity to be the physical leaders. And we, if we qualify, the spiritual leaders under Jesus Christ. But particularly our young people, you have an opportunity to explore and to pioneer a brand new world which is yet to come. It's not the end, brethren, that we're looking at, or that we're picturing here with this piece. It's a new beginning. Believe it or not, that new world is going to come. I say that particularly to our young people, because sometimes for them that's very hard to picture. Now, young people, that's going to happen with or without you. You have the choice to make to fight it or to be a part of it. And you have to decide that you want to be in that world. Will you let yourself be one of the casualties along the way? One of those who tragically chose to sell his or her future out for the pleasure and the acceptance of this world. And brethren, those of you whom God's Spirit dwells in, all of us have to make that same choice. We'll have to make it today, tomorrow, and right up to the time that 
Jesus Christ returns. Now there's an interesting comparison. And the sermonette's already alluded to it. It's a comparison of the weekly Sabbath and what it pictures and a promised land. It is promised to ancient Israel. Let's notice it here in Hebrews, the third chapter. Now, if some of my reading seems a little different. It's because I'm reading from the New International Version, but I don't think you have any problem following along in the King James. So we're beginning here in Hebrews, the third chapter, verse 5. And Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's house, testifying to what would be said in the future. Did you know Moses was a prophet? He called that prophet. But Christ is faithful as a son over God's house, and we are his house, that is the church of God, if we hold on to our courage and the hope of which we boast. Warning again, Serve the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear his voice, that is Jesus Christ's voice, and do not harden your heart, do not become callous, let it become old to you. Let it become something that, oh, I've all, already heard all of that, as you did in the rebellion, during the time of the testing of the desert. Remember the testing when they rebelled against God and didn't want to go into the promised land and said, oh no God, that's too difficult, that's too hard. Well, your fathers tested and tried me for 40 years, saw what I did. That is why I was angry with that generation. And I said, their hearts are always going astray. and They have not known my way. So I declare on an oath in my anger, God said, they shall never enter my rest. Paul here is saying that there's a tremendous lesson for us. We picture our time of rest, that millennium. Remember that God doesn't change if we should become angry with any one of us. Now, chapter 4 of Hebrews, where Paul develops this a little bit more thoroughly. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands. Now, that's the promise, brethren, of the world tomorrow. That is God's rest. That's what this world has been waiting. That's what Paul said, that the whole creation is groaning in travail, waiting for the rest of God. Let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. We have uh, had the gospel preached to us just as they did. But the message that they heard was of no value to them. All of the many things that Moses told them had no effect because those who heard it did not combine it with faith. You see, brother, they just didn't believe what Moses said. They didn't believe that even after God had divided the Red Sea from the walk to on dry land, after God had great brought the greatest nation on the face of the earth, Egypt, down to its knees with ten plagues, after God had rained food down to them every day, save the Sabbath, and caused water, clay, clean, pure water to come out of solid granite, Miracle after miracle, day after day. And they didn't believe that God could give them the promised land. They didn't have the faith. Now we, who have believed, enter that rest. Yes, brethren, we're right on the very brink of it. And every week as we observe the Sabbath, the seventh day, we picture the millennium of God just as God has said. So I declare on an oath in my anger, God says, that they shall never enter my rest. God is speaking to us now. And yet his work has been finished since the creation of this world. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day these words. And on the seventh day God rested from all his work. And they again in the passage above he said, 
They shall never enter my rest. They'll never come in to what that seventh day picture. But it still remains that some will enter that rest. Those who formerly had the gospel preached to them did not go in because of their disobedience. Therefore God, again said in a certain place, and in verse 7, calling it today, but a long time later he spoke through David, as was said before. Now Paul is making the connection again, brethren, of the weekly Sabbath and what it pictures, namely the millennium, the rest of God, and that promised land that was promised to ancient Israel. That's Paul's analogy here. Today, if you hear his voice, if you believe the very pages of your Bible, do not harden your heart. For if Joshua, I believe your King James says Jesus, but it should be translated Joshua. For if Joshua had given them rest, now if the promise had really been the ultimate rest, God would not have spoken later about another day, another rest, brethren, yet to come. There remains then a Sabbath of rest. And what that Sabbath pictures for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from his own work, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter the rest so that no one will fall, will fall by following the example of disobedience. So Paul says, here we are at this time, picturing the millennium, right as we're ready to enter our promised land. Brethren, don't lose out because of disobedience. Now to make this connection in Hebrews 4 and what Paul is telling us, I think it would be interesting to go back to that very period of time the brethren parallels this time. Because we too are right on the border ready to enter into the promised land. For us, it's the millennium. And for them, it is a land of milk and honey with physical blessings beyond anything that they had dreamed. And we go back to the book of Numbers, the 13th chapter. First of all, Moses is giving the command that he sent some spies out to scout out the promised land and then to bring back a report to the people of Israel. Here in Numbers 13, verse 1. That's just one of you. The Lord said to Moses, Send some of the men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to Israel. From each ancestral tribe send one of its leaders. So at the Lord's command, Moses sent them out from the desert of Haran, uh, and all of those leaders of Israel, and these are their names. And they went ahead and named all of them. So God had told them to send out one representative to each tribe. Verse 6, we notice. And from the tribe of Judah, one Caleb was sent. A young man by the name of Caleb represented the tribe of Judah. We're going to look at this Caleb and what happened. Now they went out and explored the land, and we come on down here to verse 17. And when Moses sent them to explore Canaan, he said to them, Go up through Negev and into the hill country and see what the land's like and whether the people who live there are strong or weak. For we are many. Few or many, excuse me. What kind of land do they live in? Is it good or is it bad? What kind of towns do they live in? Are they unwalled or fortified? And how is the soil? Is it fertile or poor? These trees are not. Do your best to bring back some of the fruit of that land. It was the season of the first ripe grape. Now, brother, and reader, that's what the sermons are doing. They're telling you what that land is going to be like from the pages of your Bible. 
describing what the world tomorrow is like, trying to capture a vision of what it's going to be like when we step across the border into that new land. And that's what the ministers are trying to do for us. So they went up and explored the land from the desert of Zin, as for Rainbow, into Lebo, a Hamas. Then on here in verse 23, when they reached the valley of Eskol, they cut off a branch bearing a single cluster of grapes. Why in the world would they just take one cluster of grapes? Well, the rest of the scripture tells us why they only just took one. And it took two of them to carry it on a pole between or among them. Can you imagine a cluster of grapes that it would take two strong men to carry it? Can you imagine what, I don't know if they had apples back then, but how big were the apples then? You know, what are men like to have tomatoes in that country? Or onions? Or the other produce? Now, it's hard to imagine a cluster of grapes that it would take two men. That's the weight a hundred pounds or more. Can you imagine what kind of a land that was like? Well, kids, let's have a grape for dinner. We can always finish the rest for, di- for uh, breakfast tomorrow. Wow, that was some land. Well, verse 25 says that they took a full 20 uh, excuse me, 40 days to explore the land. They went all the way up through it and examined the cities, the different peoples, and the curve of the coastline, up into the mountains, and they got a thorough report of what that land was like. Then they bring the report back to Moses and the children of Israel. It's kind of like the old story. We've got good news for you, and we've got bad news for you. Now first, the good news. Verse 26. Then came back to Moses and Aaron, the whole and the whole Israel community in the desert at Paran, and they reported to them to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. And they gave Moses the account. We went into the land which he sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. And here's the fruit. It's a fantastic land. It's everything that God said it would be. Excuse me, that was the report. Then, verse 28, the bad news. But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. And we even saw the descendants of Anak there, the Amalekites living in Negev, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites living in the hill country, the Canaanites living near the sea and along the Jordan. As we saw all the people of this land and their armed to the teeth. I mean, there's some mean dudes in that land. Now Caleb gives his report. Now, this is the other 11. Caleb gives up and gives his report about it. Now notice the difference. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. Short and to the point. Caleb didn't see it the way they saw it. Caleb said, Let's go get it. It's ours. What are we waiting for? It's fantastic. Let's move. But the other spies didn't feel that way about it. They go on and report in verse 31, but the men had gone up with him and said, We can't attack those people. They're stronger than we are. And they spread uh, among the Israelites a bad report about the land that they explored. And they said the land we explored devours those that live in it. That almost sounds like a little child describing something. It just devours it. I asked one of my children, I said, well, where is such and such? I don't know. It's nowhere to be found. It's just kind of like the house devoured the object. Maybe a month later, all found it, the house picked it out again. So this, this is a, a people-eating land. You just eat people up, I guess, when you go in. And all the people that we saw, they are of great size. 
And we saw the Nephilim, and their descendants of Anak came from Nephilim, I guess it is, and we seemed like grasshoppers in our eyes, and we looked the same to them. We're just like little buds on the sidewalk compared to these people. They are gigantic. Now, when you read about uh, men like Goliath, maybe they didn't exaggerate about the size of some of those people. But they should have remembered, of course, at this time, they didn't know the story of Goliath. That little David took Goliath with just one stone because God was with David. So they were frightened. And they were afraid. And they said it was just too difficult. And we go to chapter 14, verse 1. Now that night, all the people of the land and the community rose their voices and wept aloud. Literally, they were crying and yelling and griping and belly aching and moaning. And all the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole assembly said to them, If only we would have died in Egypt. If you read this story, that phrase came up a lot of times the time they come up to the land of Egypt, I mean the promised land. Or in the desert. Why is the Lord bringing us up to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and our children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it have been better for us to go to Egypt and then slaves again? And they said to each other, we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. We ought to just turn around and go the other way. This is too difficult. It isn't worth it. Moses and Aaron fell down on their faces in front of the whole of Israel and assembly gathered there. And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of uh, Jephthah, who were among those who had explored the land, tore their clothes, which was a sign of blasphemy, because of blasphemy in their presence, and said to enter into, uh, and said to the entire assembly, the land we possess to be explored and that we export is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, they were saying to the people, he will lead us into that land. And that's the very thing that God promises us. If God is pleased with us, he'll lead us into the land. He'll take us to the place of safety. And he'll assure us a way into his kingdom. A land flowing with milk and with honey and will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord. And do not be afraid of the people of the land, because we will swallow them up. And their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. And notice what their leaders were telling them, those guided by God and God's Spirit. And what was their answer to that? What was their attitude? Well, the whole assembly talked about stoning them. Stoning Moses and Joshua and Caleb. And then the glory of the eternal appeared in the tent of meeting to all of Israel. God himself came down. And I put a stop to the stoning, at least for a while. God stepped in. Oh, no, you're not going to stone Moses and Caleb and Joshua. Verse, as I find it in my notes, I'll tell you what that next verse is. Verse 22, I knew I had it there. Let's skip on down to verse 22. Now, this is the report that came from God. Not one of the men who saw my glory and the miracle signs I performed in Egypt and in the desert but who disobeyed me and tested me ten times. Not one of them will ever see the land I promised on an oath to their forefathers. God made a promise, as we read again in Hebrews earlier. He said not a single man or woman over the age of twenty. Save Caleb, Moses, Aaron, and a handful of people will see the promised land. Your children will, but you will not. God said, No one who has attested me with contempt or treated me with contempt will ever see it. But because of my servant Caleb, who has a different spirit, 
And not only the Spirit of God, brethren, but a different attitude, a different approach, and followed me wholeheartedly. I will bring him into the land he went to, and his descendants will inherit it, God said. God made it the distinction between them. And God said, but Caleb, that's Caleb will enter in. I'll make the story short in Numbers 32, 12. Again, it says of Caleb that he was wholehearted and he wholeheartedly followed God. In other words, his heart was in it. He went with God all the way. He never held back anything. It says in Joshua 14, well, you're turning the numbers and I'm going on. I do that. Numbers 14, verses 13 through 15. I wouldn't turn to that one either. I'll be gone. But Caleb received Hebron, one of the prime inheritances in the promised land. So God fulfilled his promise. But still further, it says in Numbers 34, verses 17 through 19, that Caleb was made one of the princes of his own tribe. And that he had a part in dividing the promised land to the different families and deciding who was going to receive what. He, become one, he became one of the prominent leaders in Israel. God bestowed that honor upon Caleb. Now, we have another individual that came to the promised land. And let's notice what happened to him. We saw Caleb. We saw the end result. We saw Caleb's attitude. Now here in Joshua, and this one you can turn to, because I'll be here for a little while. Joshua 6. Now they're just inside the promised land. They're right, right near the border of it. Jericho is about to fall. Joshua 6, verse 17, God gives these special instructions about Jericho. Now the city and all that is in it are to be devoted to the eternal. Only Rahab, the prostitute, and all who were with her in her house shall be spared, because she hid the spies we sent. But keep away from the devoted things, as my translation says, so that you will not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. Otherwise, you will make the camp of Israel liable to destruction and bring disaster upon yourself. For all the silver and the gold and articles of bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord and must go into his treasury. So God gave some very specific instructions. He says, you keep your hands off of these items. They're not yours. They're mine, God said. I am going to cause Jericho to fall. And these are from my treasury later on to be kept up, maybe even to the time of the temple. Now, just as in our days, sometimes people don't believe God. God gives a commandment, and they think, well, surely God doesn't mean for me to go to quite that extreme. Sometimes our teenagers think, well, maybe God's just a little too strict for us. And if my parents don't say, who's the wiser? Who'll know? I mean, if I do it in secret and I cover my tracks well, I don't have to worry about it. And there was an individual back then that thought that way. Boy, was he wrong. Go to chapter 7 now. Joshua, we begin in verse 4. So, there were about 3,000 that went up and they were routed by the men of Ai. Now, this is the next city that they were to conquer. Jericho fell and Joshua got talked into only sending 3,000 against Ai because Ai was a little podunk town. I mean, Ai wasn't much. It was a third-rate city-state. Why don't we let all these people rest and we'll just send 3,000 up and we'll take care of Ai and then we'll go on. But they were routed by the men of Ai who killed about 36 of them. 
And they chased the Israelites from the city gate as far as the stone quarry and struck them down on the slope. And at this the heart of the people melted and became like water. They had an embarrassing defeat. Thirty-six innocent men died. And Joshua received the report of it, verse 6, and Joshua tore his clothes and fell on his face down on the ground before the ark of the Lord and remained there till evening. And the elders of Israel did the same and sprinkled dust on their heads. And that was a sign of blasphemy. Again, something horrible had happened. And Joshua said, O sovereign Lord or eternal, why did you ever bring those people across Jordan to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? If only we had been content to stay on the other side of Jordan. Joshua at this point was very disheartened. Israel had been humiliated. In verse 10, the Lord said to Joshua, Stand up! What are you doing, Joshua, down on the ground? That must have been kind of embarrassing. Joshua, what are you laying down there for? Get up, man! That's no place for you to be, a conqueror, the leader of my people, laying there groveling in the dirt. Verse 11, Israel, God said, has sinned. They have violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They have taken some of the devoted things that they have stolen. And they have lied. And they have put them in their own possession. That is why Israel cannot stand against their enemies. They have turned their backs and run because they have made liable the destruction. And I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever is among you. That is devoted to destruction. God said He would not tolerate sin among His people. That sin must be eradicated, it must be put out. It's interesting that this episode happened during the days of unleavened bread or thereabouts. It seems that Jericho fell during the days of unleavened bread. But there was some sin that had not been put out. God said He wouldn't tolerate it. Now, really, what happened? Well, further on down the verse, we begin to find out the details of it. In verse 13, God said, Consecrate the people. Tell them to consecrate, your, consecrate yourselves in preparation for tomorrow. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, said. That which is devoted among you, O Israel, you cannot stand against your enemies until you remove it. Things that were to be God that you've taken to yourself. Verse 14, chapter 7. In the morning, present yourselves tribe by tribe. The tribe the Lord takes shall come forward clan by clan. Clan and the clan the Lord takes shall come forth in family by family. And the family that the Lord takes shall come before man by man. And this is God's way of singling out the individual that was guilty. What they did is they had a casting of a lot. Really, brother, what a much difference in torn dice. Except God guided it. God was going to pick out the one that was guilty. That had caused those 36 men to die. That had caused Israel to be humiliated. In verse 19. Joshua said, because he'd gone through this whole process, and he said unto Achan, My son, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, and give him the praise. Tell me what you have done. Do not hide it from me. Achan, what have you done? And Achan replied, It's true. At least he had the decency at this point to admit. I have sinned against the Eternal, the God of Israel. This is what I have done. When I saw in the plunder a beautiful robe from Babylon, 200 shekels of silver, that'd be about five pounds, a wedge of gold of 50 shekels, that'd be about a pound and a quarter, maybe pure gold. 
You can kind of imagine how much that would be worth. You know, inflation changes things, but gold and silver remain valuable. And I coveted them, and I took them, and they are hidden in the ground inside my tent with the silver underneath it. So Achan had taken these things that God had commanded them not to take. The temptation right at the moment was too much for Achan. It just seemed so beautiful, it was pleasant to the eyes. It was something that he desired that would make him wealthy. Nobody would know. He just took a little bit and hide it away. Now God had promised that he'd bless them, he'd give them the land. The wealth was to come later, brethren. But they weren't, Achan was not willing to wait for God. He wanted to take it now. He wanted to take it in the wrong way. You know, sometimes teenagers, and sometimes adults, we find ourselves in the same bind. Because some of the things of this world that God forbids, we want to take now. And we want to take things that are unlawful and that are wrong. And that's what Achan did. Verse 25. Joshua said, Why have you brought this disaster on us? The Lord will bring disaster on you today. And all Israel stoned him. And after they had stoned the rest, they burned them. And Achan, they heaped up a large pile of rock, which remains to this day. There's an editorial note, at least the time this was written, remains. And then the Lord turned from his first anger. And there, uh, therefore that place has been called the Valley of Achor ever since. It means disaster. The Valley of Disaster. But then we have two individuals. One, Caleb, who wholeheartedly followed God, who was zealous, who said, let's take it now. And Achan, who sold out to his future, who had to have it right now, who wanted things that God had forbidden. Achan was a real loser. And Achan ended in destruction. Now we're going to hear more, I'm sure throughout the pieces we've already heard some, about how great our promised land is going to be. How fantastic the world tomorrow is going to be. But God himself, in the form of Jesus Christ, is going to stand on this earth and bring it peace. A world beyond our imagination. So fantastic will it be. But the question is, young people, and the question is all of us, brethren, will you be there? Will you be a part of that land? Will you go in the way of Achan? Now let's just notice in the New Testament, I think the scriptures should apply to the way of Achan. Here in Mark 4, for example, in verse 19. Now this is the parable of the sower, and it talks about a certain group among them. But the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desire for the things, for other things, comes in and chokes the word and makes it unfruitful. And Jesus said that's a very real danger. That the truth you know, the promises that you have been given, can be choked out, and you can be left out, if you allow them. It's the very thing that happened to Achan. It was just too tempting for him, and he gave in. And he lost out. First Peter is another example of the way of Achan. First Peter 2 and verse 11. Peter writes, he says, Dear friends, 
I urge you, as an alien and a stranger, as I believe the King James says, as children, as aliens and strangers in the world, to abstain from the sinful desires which war against your soul, which you have to constantly fight. Sometimes it's an attitude. Sometimes it's something you want that you know is not yours. Something that you want to grasp. You shouldn't live such a uh, well. I don't guess I don't need to go ahead and read the rest of it. But that war against this, brethren, that these are the things that we have to be willing to leave behind. In other words, those lusts, those things that we want that are not right, will destroy it. One other step that I will read, though, in regards to. It's emphatic. It is over here in John. That's John, the second chapter. and uh, First John, the second chapter. Excuse me, in verse 16. Now, John writes, he says, For everything in this world, the terror, the craving of this of the sinful man, the lust of the eye, the boasting of what he has and does comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away. But the man who does the will of God lives forever. In other words, we're at the point to make a choice. When we sell out the promises of God, the things that God has wants to give us, a full inheritance with Jesus Christ for things that we would like to have now. That's the point. That's the attitude of Achan. How cheaply will you sell your soul? Now let's just take a minute and look at the attitude of Caleb. My little clock went out, Mr. Pesci, so I guess I'm not held accountable for the time from here on out. Fortunately, I have a watch. It doesn't work either, though. Uh, Matthew 11. Matthew 11. And verse 12. Now we're going to look at the attitude of Caleb. Now God was pleased with Caleb. There was something about Caleb that was different than all the other men around him. And remember, Caleb was in the same society. Caleb grew up with these people. Caleb was just like one of the others. He had the influence of the other 11 men that went out to spy the land. But there was something different about Caleb. Now, Matthew 11, verse 12, it says, From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing. And there's more than one meaning to this, but I'm going to focus in on the second meaning. It's very applicable has been forcefully advancing. And the forceful men lay hold on it. I like the way the Moffat translates that. I believe your Bible says, the violent take it by force. Moffat says that these eager souls are storming it. You know, that was the very attitude of Caleb. He said, let's go get it. It's ours. He was zealous. He had drive. Caleb was a man of character. Caleb saw what it was, and he believed that God would give it to them. And so Caleb said, let's go get it. And that's the attitude, brethren. That's the attitude, young people, that God wants to see in us. That we want it with all of our being, and we're willing to push everything else aside to obtain the kingdom of God. It's not the wallflower. It's not the timid person. It's not the milk toast. It's going to inherit the kingdom of God. It's not something that just wants to float along with society and not make any way. It's the person who's willing to stand up for what he believes in and grasp the hold of the promises that God has laid at our feet. Again, in Matthew 7, notice Jesus' words. Matthew 7, in verse 13, Jesus makes a comparison about the promised land about the world tomorrow, about inheriting the promises God has given us. Matthew 7, verse 13. 
Jesus said, Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. The great wide broad way, the way that the society is going, hell bent for destruction. The way your society, all your peers are going, the way your schools are going, the way your friends are going. If you get caught up in their attitude and the way they see things, you're going to be fucked you. But then this promise is yours. And your children, not just for the adults, not just for the baptized members, brethren, but for even for our children the promise is for us. And for all who are far off, even down to the distant millennia of time, to our age, for all whom the Lord God will call. God has laid this promise before them. It's ours for the taking. If you'll have the courage, if you'll have the zeal, if you'll have the drive to go into the promised land. Additional programs and literature available at hwalibrary.com.